So yesterday we saw two positive ads released at the very start of the campaign, yet by day's end, the first negative commercial was already coming out as well. What do you think this campaign is going to be in terms of style? Well, look, I reckon it's going to be a sort of a two-track campaign in a sense on both sides. That is, the leaders are going to have a fair bit positive to say. I think Scott Morrison will probably have a fair bit negative to say about Labor and tax plans and the risk of putting a Labor government in and what it's going to do to the budget and all those sort of things. But he can't do that exclusively, so he'll have to have a fair bit positive to say about his government's record of you know, fiscal management and what it means, the dividends in the future, tax cuts, you know, wage rises, which seems somewhat mythical at the moment, but uh, that seems to be you know, one, of their, one of their promises. And Shorten, too, will have to uh, you know, sort of be quite positive. Mm. Uh, they've got a fair bit more to be positive about, I think, in terms of their plans to do things in a whole range of areas that voters like. But the, but the other campaign, that is the campaign that's waged for the hearts and minds on primetime television every night, is going to be waged through television ads, that, you know, like the ones you're just talking about. And there I expect there to be a lot of negative campaigning on both sides. And the reason I say that is that it's not just the government that is going to be talking about you know, bad things. Mm. Labor needs to remind voters and keep fresh in voters' minds the chaos and dysfunction of leadership changes and, and ministers and defections and you know, resignations and Barnaby Joyce and Section 44, all the, all the bizarre things that the 45th Parliament threw up. And uh, it can't afford, that is, Labor can't afford to let voters forget any of that because that probably accounts for most of Labor's lead in the polls over the last three years. But yet, at the same time, Bill Shorten's the last link in a way to Labor's own chaos and leadership turmoil and changing prime ministers. Do you think that strategy of highlighting chaos in the coalition ranks could also then remind people of chaos in the Labor ranks? Look, I, d I don't really think that's a huge risk. I mean, I, I think that's priced in to Bill Shorten's relatively low popularity already. Uh, and I mean, Scott Morrison's running this line yesterday, if you vote for me, because this was raised with him, the issue of, you know, how can you guarantee, Prime Minister, that if people vote for you, uh, they'll get you? And he said, look, you will. We've changed our culture. We've changed our rules, just like Labor has. If you vote for me, you get me. If you vote for Bill Shorten, you get Bill Shorten. You know, that's the, yeah. that's the sort of government line. So yeah. I expect that to uh, be you know, prosecuted over and over again, because the government does see Bill Shorten as Labor's weakest link. Yeah. Um, but as I say, I think it's largely priced in already, and yet we still see Labor leading and have, have seen them leading consistently for pretty much this entire term. So voters have been saying, we're, we're planning to change the government, or at least we're inclined to change the government even though we're not particularly inspired by Bill Shorten. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I reckon that's just going to go on. Now, the, as for whether um, the chaos and dysfunction line works against the government, I think it does, because it's much fresher in people's minds and because the coalition, you know, I mean, that, that is the government that's there now. You know, people voted initially <coughs> for Tony Abbott, then they ended up with Malcolm Turnbull, which for the most part voters seemed to like until they worked out that Malcolm Turnbull wasn't that different from Tony Abbott as a result of the deals he'd done. Yeah. And then for no reason at all that's ever been explained, he was suddenly replaced by Scott Morrison. Yeah. And yep. people are going, what happened there? And of course, we've seen a whole slew of ministers leave, uh, particularly prominent ones like Julie Bishop and Kelly O'Dwyer. We've seen you know, a defection. We've seen resignations all over the place. It has been a very chaotic government. And so Scott Morrison's, you know, really wanting to kind of, that, that's his problem in a way. He's wanting to run on his record at one level and kind of completely hide the record of the government on another level. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned before about aspiration of Labor and how they do that aspirational policy. They do a lot of progressive policies. And yet for a long time there, it was also the strength of Malcolm Turnbull, the way he talked progressive policies, the way he talked about marriage equality and how he wanted to be associated towards the very end of the, that campaign with being a supporter of it. Mm. Do you think, though, that the aspirational message of the government is going to get lost by Labor's aspirational messaging strategy? It probably will. I think, I mean, I, I, you know, as, as I described it last week after the two sides had done their budget and budget and reply, I thought Labor put forward vision, the government had essentially put forward accounting. Yeah. And th those two things don't really compete. I mean, Labor was, is, is speaking to the hearts of people as well as their minds. And I think the coalition is speaking more to their minds uh, and to some insecurities they might feel about, you know, Labor 
you know, blowing the budget surplus down the track and, you know, spending too much money and raising taxes and these sorts of things. I mean, Labor does have an image problem there, there's no question. Um, but I think, again, I think a lot of that is already priced in and voters do want to see action on climate change. They do want to see action on flat wages. They do want to see more money put into education and training. They do feel like uh, things like, you know, pumping serious extra money into cancer relief and cancer research is another $125 million announced on day two by Labor for cancer research, specifically in 20 million, I think, for pancreatic cancer, which is a particularly, you know, low survival rate cancer. So. Those sort of things really do connect with people, and that, yeah. that was what Labor's uh, pitch was in, the, in both the sort of budget reply and in what Shorten's had to say since. It's been about establishing connection points with, with voters. You know, there's no doubt the government's got a good story to tell here too in terms of management of the economy. It's projecting a surplus, uh, and it's projecting surpluses down the track, and it's also uh, proposing quite significant income tax cuts. But how much do voters buy that, really, if, the, if those income tax happen in, uh, cuts happen in 2022 and in 2024 and, you know, the surpluses that they're banking a lot on, they're, they're 10 years down the track. So we're getting into sort of airy fairyland yeah. here in, in politics, a bit probably on both sides, but I think Labor starts ahead in this election campaign and has a better hearts and minds mix in its policies. For that reason, do you think that Labor will go very hard early on with the election campaign as well to try and keep those people they've got right now um, and get them into pre-poll voting, get those numbers banked before the actual election date, just in case there's any sort of surprises on the campaign trail being launched by the coalition, a la what happened with Michael Daly in the mm. New South Wales election? Yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind too, as you were saying that the Michael Daly thing. I, I saw Michael Daly, uh, the only time I ever met him actually was at a press club lunch uh, in the second in the second to last week of that campaign when the, uh, Michael Daly's Labor opposition was travelling very well in that New South Wales election. And even one of his staff said to me that, you know, things don't always go as well as yeah. they were going. He actually predicted that something was coming. Well, as it happened, that video emerged of, you know, Daly saying that, you know, Chinese people with PhDs were taking jobs and suddenly the campaign just fell apart. Yeah. Um, so it's true, events can happen in campaigns and anything we say now, now about what looks like the likely outcome and how voters are going to you know, connect and react and so forth, all of that's subject to you know, the events and the unknowns and even, even external events really that can influence campaigns. But I think you're right, if, if Labor's ahead at the start of the campaign, then it probably wants to get as many people voting early as, as, as possible to, uh, to sort of bank that support before uh, anything, you know, why leave it up to chance? I think uh, pre-poll voting opens on the 29th of April, so Correct, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not far away really, uh, and uh, you know, that, then, then uh, I guess um, you know, people will start casting their votes, and it used to be that the pre-poll votes favoured the Conservative side, maybe that's always going to be the case, the theory was that uh, conservative voters uh, were more inclined to be wealthy and wealthy people were more likely as a cohort to, you know, to be away, travelling, holidaying, whatever it might be. So, uh, you know, we'll just have to wait and see on that. But I reckon Labor's probably going to be going pretty hard on those pre-poll votes. Yeah. And you talked to me before about connection points, right? And one of my things I look at and, that, and I think about anyway is we can also have disconnection points where we just walk away from something or a brand or a, or a candidate because of whatever issue. To me, Adani's one such issue. There's a point there where both sides are going to have to come out clearly and say whether they want it or don't. And I, I see this as being a, you know, a great opportunity for those on the flanks, be it One Nation or Clive Palmer and the Greens on the left, to come out and really hurt either Labor on, on one side or on the other for the coalition, hurt them on the far right flank. Do you think that could be the case? Well, I think I agree sort of broadly, although I think in a sense that, that kind of bifurcation of that issue is almost worse for Labor than it is for the government. There's no doubt there's a lot of Liberals in, in Victoria who are nervous about Adani and who were hoping that the government wouldn't you know, commit itself any further and Adani as an issue wouldn't you know, play too strongly because it doesn't scan well in, in urban Victoria, for example. Yeah. Uh, but in Queensland, where there, where there are supposedly a lot of jobs associated with it, and I say supposedly because I don't think the, uh, the employment uh, associations of that project are anywhere near as rosy as is, its advocates have you know, often said. But nonetheless, in Queensland, where jobs are an issue and where Labor has a, uh, you know, should have and does have a very strong relationship with Labor unions there who care about 
jobs and uh, regional economies and so forth, uh, Adani is uh, you know, something they need to support as well. So I think both parties have this kind of dualism in their positions and it makes it quite hard for them. If, in truth, I think both of them would just wish it wasn't an yeah, issue. Because, I agree with you. Yeah. Because it's not so, uh, not so hard to sort of, you know, kind of uh, narrow cast different positions. And I think for that that's reason, though, that's why it's going to kick on for the campaign, because both parties are trying to figure out a way to deal with that, this issue yeah. without coming across as being either anti-Queensland or anti-inner city electorates. Yeah. And it's going to be a really tough one. I think it'll drag out into maybe the second or third week of the campaign before they sort of right. resolve it. Yeah. I mean, they're both, you know, the, the, what, what are they saying in politics? They're both walking both sides of the street. Yeah. You know, they're sort of trying to, uh, I mean, look at the way Labor's kind of messaging it. It's, you know, it's sort of... It's kind of dog whistling a bit about Isn't Adani it? saying yeah. that it doesn't really like the project, but it won't do anything to uh, to sort of create sovereign risk, which means that if Labor is elected and if contracts have been signed, Labor will honour those contracts. Uh, and it's you know just proposing that it, you know it's it's wanting to be seen as being sort of essentially you know hostile or, or unenthusiastic about the project, at the same time as not actually saying it will stop the project because of those reasons we were talking about before. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough one. Yeah. I remember back in, back in John Howard's time, right, Linton Crosby, the, the famous Liberal Party strategist and campaign director, um, you know, when he, he saw Howard being behind the polls, he turned it into trying to make it a race for local seats on local issues. Um, and I see that happening in this election yeah. because they are behind, but yet you look at the way it's playing out too, not every seat's a winner for the coalition and not every seat's a winner for Labor either. Yeah. And I think it'll come down to a battle of 20 or 25 seats. Um, and that's it's a very good I, point. Yeah, and I think really we're, that's where we're going to see the battle play out. Um, I don't note this morning And it won't be uniform either because I think we'll correct. probably... I mean, the, like you can name five seats, five Liberal seats in Victoria, for example, yeah. which you can sort of in, in, in light pencil put into the Labor column now, assuming that, you know, the Garden State is, you know, more progressive and, and that the, the redistribution is you know, tip them into, into Labor's favour. But um, it's also possible that uh, you know, the government could, you know, the coalition could make some gains in yeah. some other places. It Correct. could pick up Lindsay in, in New South Wales. It could pick up a couple of seats, one or two seats in Tasmania. Um, it, could, it could do better in Queensland than, uh, you know, like Herbert, for example, a Labor seat could return to the coalition. Uh, Indi in uh, in Victoria, which is you know Kathy McGowan's seat, the Independent, that could return to the Liberal Party or to the Nationals. Um, so it's um, you know we we might actually see a broad shift towards Labor, but with some of those losses um, you know ameliorated by by some against the against the current sort of gains by the government. Do you think for that reason there could be some surprises on preference deals? Do you think there could be some minor players who at the moment people don't really care about, pay any attention to, but come a week, maybe two weeks from now, when we start to get a feel for how the election's going, but also how parties are performing, we could see some shocks and surprises, a la Clive Palmer, United Australia Party, suddenly going from nothing to their $28 million spend so far in advertising, suddenly paying dividends because they can make preference deals in some of these more marginal seats up and down the coast. Look, it's possible. Can I just say about that $28 million spend of Clive Palmer's, if that figure is right? I mean, that yeah. is a disgrace. That's a Quentin Nielsen, so... Yeah, well, that is, in my view, that is a disgrace. I mean, when, when you actually see really wealthy people around the world actually using their money, their excess money for good, this is just a completely futile vanity project. Yeah. It's not going to go anywhere. He's not going to win any seats. Yeah. Uh, and, it, it, you know, having Clive Palmer's face on billboards and bobbing up on television, it, it really, I think, uh, given his performance as an MP when he was there, when he was hardly ever rolling up to the House of Representatives, and you know, we know the sort of behaviour of that company, and you know, Queensland Nickel and workers not getting paid and so forth. It's really, uh, really pretty pathetic. It is. It is amazing. I think they need to put a cap on this sort of thing because 28 million dollars so far, by the way. So if those figures are correct, they're predicting 50 million dollars for his campaign alone by the end of the election. That and it means won't, it, won't, it won't win them anything. No, uh, it'll make it an arms race though, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and it'll make that effect where we start to question where the money is in politics. And I think we're looking at 2019 election being the first one in Australian history where we hit nine figures on spend.